change your life today. He can do it. Praise God. Praise God. Let's all stand together. We're going to open our Bibles this morning to the book of Judges. Book of Judges, chapter 6, and also the book of Acts, chapter 9. We will first go to the Old Testament, the book of Judges, chapter 6, and begin at verse number 11, and then read down to verse 16. Then one verse out of Acts, chapter 9. We enjoyed the ministry of Brother Wilmoth Wednesday night. Always enjoy our local ministers when they are preaching. And of course, they are in South Boston, Virginia today at their service there. They have service on Sunday morning, Sunday night, and during the week on Tuesday night. And they're at our church on Wednesday night. In the next few months, I would like to get together a group of folks that would like to go on a Sunday night over to South Boston and just just be a shot in the arm to them. Just provide an atmosphere and some warm bodies and get to maybe fellowship a little bit after church. And, uh, you know, that's so important for a new church plant, to know that they are not just out there all by themselves, that they have some fellow believers. Amen. Fellow believers. When we were starting out here in Kernersville, you know, boy, it was nice when uh, somebody would show up and say, I'm here just to help church with you, just help you worship. That meant a whole lot. Amen. Judges chapter 6, verse number 11. If you have it, say praise the Lord. There came an angel of the Lord, he sat under an oak which was in Ophrah that pertained unto Joash the Abizarite, his son Gideon, threshed wheat by the winepress to hide it from the Midianites. The angel of the Lord appeared unto him and said unto him, The Lord is with thee, thou mighty man of valor. And Gideon said unto him, Oh, my Lord, if the Lord be with us, why then is all this befallen us? And where be all his miracles, which our fathers told us of, saying, Did not the Lord bring us up from Egypt? But now the Lord hath forsaken us and delivered us into the hands of the Midianites. Notice verse 13. He said, Why then is all this befallen us? Everybody say, Why? Verse 14, the Lord looked upon him and said, Go in this thy might, and thou shalt save Israel from the hand of the Midianites. Have not I sent thee? He said unto him, O my Lord, wherewith shall I save Israel? Behold, my family is poor in Manasseh, and I am the least in my father's house. And the Lord said unto him, Surely I will be with thee, and thou shalt smite the Midianites as one man, as one man, you're going to smite the Midianites. That's important. Please remember that for future. Now, let's go back, turn to the right in the book of Acts, the New Testament. Chapter 9, we're going to read one verse. Verse number 6. Completely different story about a completely different individual, but it fits with my message this morning. Acts chapter 9, verse 6. This is the story of Saul, who later became Paul, the apostle. Wrote 14 out of 27 books of the New Testament. And Saul is laying flat on his back. He's looking up, blinded by a bright light, knocked off his donkey. And the Lord is talking to him. Verse number 6. Saul, trembling and astonished, said, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? Everybody say, what? So Gideon in Judges chapter 6 said, why? Saul in Acts chapter 9 verse 6 said, what? Two different approaches to what the Lord is doing. What wilt thou have me to do? The Lord said, arise and go into the city and it shall be told thee what thou must do. Just for a little bit here today, I want to preach to you, change your why to what? Change your why to what? Look at your neighbor and say, he's talking to you this morning. Amen. How many is going to preach with me today? Praise God. You may be seated. God bless you. Why is a word 
that we oftentimes feel pounding around in the corridors of our spirit. There's a lot of questions in my mind that for years have been summed up in one word, and that word is why. I don't think we are less than Christians for having these questions. I don't think we're sinning when we have these questions. I think it's just a human thing. Why do little babies die? It's a fair question. Why do old people have to suffer for so long in the twilight years of their life? They work hard, they try to save, they try to do right for retirement, and then they get to the end and some of them enjoy that twilight year era and some of them just suffer, suffer so terribly for so long. It's a fair question. Why do mothers of small children die and leave that small child motherless in this world? It's a fair question. Why do marriages dissolve? Why do teenagers kill themselves with so much life ahead of them, so much future? Why? 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 These are questions that we'll really never know the answers to down on this side. But in the words of the old song we used to sing growing up in church, we will understand it better by and by. How many has ever sung that song back in the day? Amen. We are often destitute of the things that life demands. One of shelter and of food, thirsty hills and barren lands. But we're trusting in the Lord and according to His word. We will understand it better by and by. By and by when the morning comes. When all the saints of God are gathering home, we will tell the story how we've overcome and we'll understand it better by and by. Oh, yeah. Well, those old timers, they knew what they were writing. Amen. Some of y'all hadn't heard that song in a long time. Some of y'all have never heard that song. I'm old. By and by. What is it saying? It's saying, you know, one day when we have the benefit of standing on the other side and we can look down at life, then it's all going to come together. A lot of those questions will be answered. Praise God. But not here. In everyone's life, there are some whys. I will tell you this morning, you're not normal if you don't have some whys. I began to study a little bit for uh, getting into some historical perspective for this message. And I read about the ancient people using an instrument, a little tiny instrument. It was very interesting. And it's called the tribulum, T-R-I-B-U-L-U-M. They would use the tribulum to beat down the grain which would divide the chaff from the wheat. We get our word tribulation from this word. The word tribulation comes from the word tribulum. Amen. What happens when we go through tribulation? Well, it separates the chaff from the wheat in human character. I read in the Bible in the book of Romans chapter 5 verses 3 and 4. And not only so, but we glory in tribulations also. Knowing that tribulation worketh patience. And patience experience. And experience hope. That's a stretch today for me to look at you and tell you with a straight face. That your tribulation that you're going through is going to eventually result in hope. But that's what the Bible says. We've got to get our, our, our thinking straightened out about how we go through tribulation and why we go through tribulation. There is a mentality among Christians today that says, Preacher, I want an experience with God that never gives me any problems. I want God, but I don't want to suffer at all in my walk with God. I want to grow to be a mature Christian, but I don't want to have any problems at all. And to that, I tell you, impossible. Impossible. The longer you live for God, the tougher it's going to get. But the stronger you'll be. 
in the process. It's not in my notes today and I wasn't planning on talking about it, but I feel in the Holy Ghost to remind you when God got the children of Israel out of Egypt, at first the miracles were just awesome. They were just powerful. I mean, Moses just stood in front of the Red Sea and took his staff and parted out the Red Sea and they walked through dry shod on eight feet foot of mud became completely dry overnight and they got on the other side and stood there and here comes Pharaoh and his army and God let the water come back and just kill all of them. I'm talking about powerful, clean, instant, immediate miracles. God, we need water. Here's water out of a rock. God, we need meat. Here comes a flock of quail. The Bible says they ate so much meat it ran out of their nose. God, we need food. Here comes fresh baked bread flowing down. Manna in the Hebrew. Manna means what is it? And that's what God said. I'm going to feed you what is it. Some of you men have eaten what is it before. Amen. What in the world is this? Just call it manna. Just say this is manna from heaven and your wife will be okay with it. Amen. Manna from heaven. And they ate manna in the morning. And they ate manna for breakfast. And they ate manna for dinner. And they had manna for midnight snack. And God fed them manna. I'm talking about he provided. But the longer they lived for God and the longer they served the Lord, the miracles did not get so easy. Because I read about another time when they came to the Jordan River and the Bible says the water was swelling past the banks. This time there was no staff parting the water. This time God told the Israelites, you get that ark and you walk out into the water and you just keep walking until I tell you to stop. You just keep walking. Walked up to the knees. Walked up to the thighs. Walked up to the waist. Walked up to the chest. And then the waters parted. What are you saying, preacher? I'm telling you, the longer you live for God and the more you serve the Lord, the more faith you're going to have to start having and the more maturity is going to be expected in your walk with God. Things may not come as easy as they used to come. Things may not come as quick as they used to come. Why? Because you're not a baby anymore. You're a grown person in your walk with God. Tribulation, Paul said, Romans 5 and 3 and 4, worketh patience. Patience worketh experience. Experience worketh hope. And ultimately, is that not all our focus should be? Is One day, we're going to see Jesus. I have a hope. That's why I can preach a funeral of a teenager, because I have a hope. That's why I can preach a funeral of a mother with a small child who, who she's left here uh, uh, motherless on this planet, because I have a hope. That's why I can talk to people that are dying of terrible situations and sicknesses, and you think, God, why are they suffering? That, that's why, because we have a hope. Everybody say hope. I read about the cocoon of the emperor moth. It's flask-like in shape. To develop into a perfect insect, the emperor moth must force its way through the neck of the cocoon by hours of intense struggle. Entomologists explain that this pressure to which the emperor moth is subjected to in that flask-like narrow little path, the pressure that this emperor moth is subject to is nature's way of forcing a life-giving substance into the wings. Wanting to lessen the seamlessly, uh, seemingly needless trials and struggles of one particular emperor moth, there was an observer that said, I will help this moth. I want to lessen the pain and the struggle of this helpless little creature. And so he took a small little pair of scissors and he snipped the restraining threads to make the moth's emergence painless and effortless. You want to know what happened? The creature never developed its wings. It's that intense struggle that causes the life-giving substance to be secreted into the wings. And when you take the struggle away, you take the wings away. For a brief time before it died, it simply crawled around on the ground instead of flying through the air on rainbow-colored wings. 
Sorrow, sufferings, trials, and tribulations are wisely designed to grow us into Christ likeness. The refining and developing processes are oftentimes slow, but through grace, I've come to encourage someone today, through grace, you're going to come out on the other side of it, and you're going to be beautiful, and you're going to do things that you never thought you'd do, and you're going to go places that you never thought you'd go. And you're going to see things in your life that you never saw, you th thought you would see. And it's only because of the process that God brought you through. Don't take my word for it. David said in Psalm 4 and 1, Thou hast enlarged me when I was in distress. Notice what David said. I was growing when I was in pain. I didn't grow and I didn't develop and I didn't morph into something beautiful when life was just great. It was in the pain that I grew. Job 23 and 10, Job said, When thou hast tried me, I shall come forth as gold. Brothers and sisters, how dare we sit here this morning? How dare we sit here this morning in the presence of one who was nailed to a cross? And ask him to lessen the pain and the struggle. How dare we sit in the presence of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. The one that allowed Roman soldiers to nail his hands, nail his feet and rip his back open with a cat of nine tails. And pierce him uh, with, with a sword, amen, a spear. And out came the blood and the water and pressed that crown of thorns down upon his brow. How dare we sit here listening to the dripping of his blood. And ask him to lessen the pain and lessen the struggle. You see, many people want to develop beautiful wings, but they don't want to go through the cocoon. Somebody say amen. I don't know why this week, but I just felt memories coming back about a young man that was in my youth group when I was youth pastor in Durham from 1990 through 1996, 91 actually, through 96. There was a young man in my youth group. His name was Ricky Cates. He's a young African-American uh, kid. I'll call him a kid. That's what he was. He was 13, 14 when we first met. And he got the Holy Ghost, got baptized, got in church. And man, you talk about a smile. When he got the Holy Ghost and he got baptized, there was a smile on his face that was electric. His mom and dad got in church, his sister got in church, his brother was a special needs young man and uh, just a really nice young man but had some uh, mental difficulty and, and uh, had, had the mind of about a, a six-year-old and was kind of stuck there but a wonderful family. And they all got in church and got involved. Brother Cates, his father, would drive a bus. Sister Cates worked in different areas in the church and Ricky uh, kind, of, uh, kind of just was attracted to me as far as uh, from a mentor standpoint and I began to use Ricky in youth services and let him kick off the service and let him, uh, he could sing. He was a very good singer and he would kick off with leading the praise and worship and had specials in the youth chorale. And I don't know why this all began to flood back to me. And then I, I began, one night I was just dozing off and I, I began to, for some reason, think about the night that I went to Ricky's funeral. And I stood in that crowded funeral home in Durham. I was already pastoring here in Kernersville and Bishop Godair called me and he said, Ricky's been found dead. And uh, I'd like for you to come to the viewing and the funeral. The family is asking that you would come. I was already pastoring here in Kernersville. And I remember that. I remember like it was yesterday, getting in the car, driving to Durham, and walking into that crowded, packed out chapel. Scarborough and Hargett Funeral Home, downtown Durham. It was packed out. It was 300, 350 people easy. And watching his father and his mother and his two siblings and a host of extended family. And, you know, I, I'll tell you, I had a lot of whys in my mind that night. Why? Why did this happen? And as I began to ask, Bishop Godair told me, uh, R Ricky had backslid and we had lost contact with him. And, and uh, about a week ago, he kind of fell off the radar and his father and mother couldn't get a hold of him. His sister couldn't get a hold of him. His brother, nobody could get a hold of him. Finally, they called uh, the police and said, hey, we, we're concerned. His car is here and he's not here. And they kicked the door in and there he was, dead, laying on the couch, backslid. 
Family didn't have money for an autopsy. They never found out why, what happened. Nobody got to say goodbye. And I began to think about conversations I had had with Ricky, just the two of us, coming on a bus home late one night from a youth rally and me driving the bus and him, he would always sit right behind me and lean up and talk to me and talking and chatting and just kind of, man, what a great service and God's going to do great things in our youth group and God's going to do great things in your life. And I, I remember sitting in that chapel that night with my eyes closed and just thinking all this flooding back, these memories of God, why, why did this have to happen? Why didn't Ricky listen? Why did he get out of church? Why didn't he pray that last time he was at church? Why did he backslide and lose out with God? Why did he die at the young age of 21? Why? God, here's a young man that you would never see without a smile on his face. Here's a young man that could sing like nobody's business. Here's a young man that worked on a bus route for years, but for some reason he lost out with God. Why? Why? And you know, we'll never know the answer to that. And they buried Ricky. And the answers to all of those questions went down in the ground with him. And of course, the family kept on going. They were a strong family and they, they took the whys of that situation and they changed it from a why to a what. I'm preaching this morning, change your why to what. They changed it from a why to a what. And they did not allow that tragedy to ruin them. I feel in the Holy Ghost this morning that there's somebody here that's going through a valley. You're going through a trial. You're going through a, an intense struggle. Whatever that might be. And you're praying desperately for relief. And the Lord is telling me to tell you it's in that struggle that you're going to get the strength to live through the next chapter of your life. I know you want the strength to get out of that right now. I know you're praying for deliverance. I know you're praying for God to give you some kind of relief. I've been where you're at and some of us are there right now. But please understand, friend, that you're gaining strength right now in your dark time. You're learning to stand in faith. You're learning to trust in God. You're learning who your friends are. You're learning who those are that are going to stand and catch your back. You're not just wasting your time. Change your why to what. Instead of saying, why, God, I want you to start saying, what do you want me to do, God? What am I learning from this? What is the plan going forward? What, what, instead of why. Saul, in Acts 9 and 6, did not ask why, as Gideon did in Judges chapter 6. Saul asked, What? Not why did you knock me down, God, but he said, Lord, what do you want me to do? Next time a trial comes in your life, brother and sister, don't sit around and suck your thumb. Don't sit around and cry. Why? But look up to heaven and say, God, what are you trying to teach me here? What are you trying to teach me? What, what, do, what is the lesson I need to learn? Praise God. We quote Psalm 23. We read from Psalm 23. We stand by Psalm 23. But I don't think we really believe Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still water. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. You want to know when you're going to learn to not fear evil? When you're walking through the valley of the shadow of death. You're not going to learn that when everything's going great and the sun is shining. You're going to learn that in the valley of the shadow of death. For thou art with me, thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Did you get that? When are you going to be comforted? In the presence of your enemies. Not when everything's going great, but in the presence of your enemies. Not when there's enough money to pay the bills, but in the presence of your enemies. Hallelujah. Come on, somebody. The Holy Ghost is talking to someone right now. Now anointest my head with oil. Praise God. The presence of mine enemies. My cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy 
shall follow me all the days of my life. And I'll dwell in the house of the Lord forever. And we love verse 6. We love verse 1. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. And we love verse 6. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I'll dwell in the house of the Lord forever. And we completely ignore verses 2 through 5. Yes, he's my shepherd. But because he's my shepherd, he's going to take me through this dark time. Literally, thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. I want you to imagine today in your spirit a shepherd sitting on a rock with his staff in his hand and a slingshot in the other. David had a slingshot. A shepherd sitting there and here's a little tiny sheep. A little tiny lamb and he's frail and he's sick and that shepherd's been having to carry that little tiny lamb for miles and miles and the shepherd's tired and the lamb is tired and finally the shepherd sits down and puts that little lamb. There's a little bit of water flowing there. There's some green grass and that little lamb, shaky little frail little lamb is getting some water and is eating and there's a hungry wolf right over there behind that bush. And that hungry wolf, boy his belly's growling. He'd love to eat him some lamb right about now. And the shepherd's saying, you want that lamb? You got to get me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Think about that. The lamb is being nourished while the enemy is watching and wishing he could kill the lamb. The lamb is being nourished. The lamb is protected within feet of an entity that could kill the lamb. We love verse 1, we love verse 6, but let's don't forget verses 2, 3, 4, 5. Amen. It's that learning process. It's that danger zone of our life. It's that valley of our life where we're learning to trust the shepherd, where we're learning to say, God's got this. God's all in control. I don't know how I'm going to pay the rent next month, but God's in control. I don't know how I'm going to put food on the table. Food's going up. Gas is going up, but God's in control. I'm not sure how my children are going to react to the culture right now, but God's in control. I know other marriages are failing, but my marriage is not going to fail. God's in control. Yea, though I walk through the valley, I will fear no evil. Come on, somebody. I'm going to change my why to what? I'm going to stop asking questions and start trusting God. I'm going to start thanking God. I don't know why you're doing it, but I trust you. I I, I don't understand it, but I trust you. I trust you. I believe you. Somebody say amen. amen. I read about the coast of Pascadera, California. It's the famed Pebble Beach. There are waves that dash with ceaseless roars and thunder among the stones on this beach. These pitiless waves toss and grind these stones together and hurl them against the rugged cliffs day and night over and over 24-7 never a holiday, never a break day and night they crush these stones and continually thrash them against the rugged cliffs. The wearing down of the stones continues unabated. Tourists come from all over the world to gather these beautiful, polished, round stones all over the world for souvenirs. As a matter of fact, if that name sounds familiar to you, one of the world's greatest golf courses is at Pebble Beach. But yet, in that quiet cove, sheltered by the cliff, there's an abundance of stones. Listen. They are not sought after. They are not collected. They are not wanted. Because they have escaped the turmoil and the beating of the waves. And their life has been peaceful. But they're ugly. And they're rough. And they're angular. And they're devoid of beauty. It's the trials that make the pebbles beautiful. God's talking to somebody here today. You've prayed, God, use me. And God says, okay. First, we've got to get you out of kindergarten. 
No, 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 God, no, I want to go into 12th grade next year. Well, we got we to gotta teach you how to read and write. Okay. God, use me. God, use me in pulpit ministry. Okay. You ready? No, God, I didn't mean like that. Come on, God. Oh, well, yeah. It's a boot camp. And it ain't 12 weeks. And we pray for God to use us. And so God says, oh, what an admirable thing. I'm going to use you. And then we say, oh, God, no, please. Change your why to what? I read this story about Pebble Beach, and I, I couldn't help but ask God to forgive us, forgive me. Because too many of us have bought into this contemporary notion of well, this church is better than that church, or this pastor is better than that pastor, because, because of what a church offers us. Instead of coming to church and saying, what can I bring to this church to help this church be a better church for everybody here? We want the easy way out. Well, do they have a coffee shop? Do they only have one service? Because I don't really want to go to two. You know, do they have this program? Do they have that program? Do they have this program? Do they have a shuttle service where I can stand there and a golf cart picks me up and takes me to my car? Folks, this is not Carowinds. It's the house of God. But it's the house of God. If I had a dime for every time people have come to me and said, Pastor, I, I, man, we, we love this church. We've come in here. And you know what? You know what attracted us is you just preach the word, man. You, you, just, you just preach it. I, we want to hear that. If I had a dime for every time I've heard that in 26 years, we could all go out to Captain Tom's Seafood and have a nice lunch today. You know what I've learned? People don't want a sugar-coated church. People don't want a social club. People don't want the lights low and a concert-like atmosphere. They want to feel God. They come to church because they want the Holy Ghost in their life. They need the, a miracle in their family. They need a miracle in their marriage. They need a miracle in their finances. They need a healing in their body. And they want to go somewhere where they know it might be a little rough, but I'm going to learn in that process. I'm going to grow. I'm going to develop. I'm going to be a better person. I read in the good book of Mark chapter 8, verses 34 and 38 about this concept of a cross. If you have your Bibles, let's turn there and I'm hurrying to a close. Mark chapter 8, verses 34 through 38. And I promise you, this scripture is not being read in pulpits all across America like it should be. Mark 8, 34. When he had called the people unto him with his disciples, Jesus said unto them, Listen, whosoever will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Everybody say the cross. See, right there, some people shut their Bible and say, Oh, no, no, I don't want no cross. Not me, man. I didn't sign up for no cross. I just want the blessings. I just want the anointing. I just want the favor. Oh, you can't get that without the cross. You can't learn to fly without struggling through the cocoon. Amen. Verse 35. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it. Look at this oxymoron is what we call this. Whosoever shall lose his life for my sake in the gospels, the same shall save it. What is Jesus saying? This is the same concept when Jesus would speak with things like the way up is down. The first shall be last. The last shall be first. Right? He that is weak is strong. He that is strong is weak. If you put yourself first, you're last. If you put yourself last, you're first. Jesus would speak in these terms. What is Jesus saying? He's saying, if your whole focus in life is to take care of you, you're going to lose everything. But if your focus in life is to put him first, friend, you're going to save everything. God's calling somebody here today. Get your priorities right. Look in verse 36. This is a rhetorical question, but it resounds today. What shall it profit a man if he gain the whole world and lose his own soul? I do some estate work. And I've done some estate work for clients that died. And they leave millions, millions of dollars to their heirs. 
And you know what? When the coroner pronounces them dead, he puts the same toe tag on them that he puts on the homeless man that they found in the gutter. And they take them into the morgue and they open that little tray and they lay them on the same stainless steel tray that they lay the drug addict. And then when they embalm them, the process is the same. They stick them in a suit, some cheap suit that bought somewhere and quadrupled in price on the funeral home bill. The same way that the homeless person. The difference might be in the container that you go in the ground, the quality of the container. But you go in the same ground the same way. I had a funeral home director tell me one time I was preaching a funeral and I said, this is an odd question, but as a preacher, I preached literally hundreds of funerals over a period of 30 years. And I said, let me ask you a question. When I buy a new suit off the rack, the pockets are sewed shut. And he smiled. He said, I know where you're going with this. And I said, do y'all take time to open the pockets? He said, why would we open the pockets on these suits? He said, they're not taking anything. And they put you in a suit with the pocket sewed shut. Because you can't take it with you. And when you open your eyes in eternity, whether it's where we hope to go or not, you're still not going to take it with you. So, listen to Mark 8, 36. Look at it again. What shall it profit a man if he gain the whole world? And lose his soul. You might be the most fastidious economic person. You might can squeeze a dime till blood comes out. You might leave millions to your heirs. But if you die lost, what benefit has it been? I'd rather be a pauper and wake up in glory. And Jesus say, welcome home. Than to die a wealthy man and be lost. Verse 37, Brother Marcus, if you'll come to the piano. Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? I'm going to ask you a hard question today. I don't ask it, please don't answer this out loud, okay? What could it be, though, if I was to bring my chair and put it right here and say, put on this chair, come lay on this chair, something or somebody can sit here that you're willing to go to hell over. Who or what would it be? Now you answer that in your mind. Please answer that privately in your mind. A chair, right here. You come and lay something in this chair or someone come sit in this chair that you are willing to go to hell over. What would it be? Now, if your mind automatically went to finances, how much money would you be willing to go to hell over? Think about it. It might get you out of a bind right now, but are you willing to spend eternity forever and ever and ever banished from Jesus, banished from glory for pleasures right now? Is it a car? Is it a person? Is it a job? Is it a title? What is it? What is it? Is it a substance? What is it? What are you willing to take? I hope the answer is nothing. And Jesus sums it up by saying in verse 38, listen. Whosoever therefore shall be ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation. And how many would agree that's the generation we're living in right now? Friend, our generation is perverted and Jesus says if you're ashamed of me and of my words in this generation does it really say this look of him also shall the son of man be ashamed when he cometh in the glory of his father with the holy angels friend when that eastern sky splits that's not the time for Jesus to look at you and say I don't know you that's the time for him to say recognize you I 
I don't want to be ashamed of him because I don't want him to be ashamed of me. Do you know the biblical way to identify with Jesus is still with a cross on your back? And I don't mean a literal cross. I was driving down Highway 66 years ago and there was a guy on the side of the road that had a big cross and he was walking down the side of the road with a big cross and he had a wheel on the back of that and the news came out the other day or right after that there was a uh, back when the newspapers used to actually be read and, and, and something you would buy and it said this guy's making a, a cross continent trip bearing a cross and he was making a statement and uh, you know uh, I, I hand it to him but that's not what bearing a cross means Peter preached Christ and him crucified in Acts chapter 2. The people of Israel could have responded with a why. But if you look in Acts chapter 2 verse 37. Instead of responding with a why. Men and brethren. What shall we do? I'm preaching today. Change your why. To what? They could have gotten upset brother Brian. They could have got upset brother Elijah. They could have said oh man you ain't going to preach to us about killing the Messiah. Who do you think you are? Why would you even say that? But instead of a why they said what shall we do? Change your why to what? And God let the most confrontational man in the whole bunch, Peter, look at them in the eyes. And he brought them to their knees because he answered their what in verse 38. He said, I'm going to answer your what. Here's the answer. Repent and be baptized. Every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. I've got more. I could tell you about Gideon. I wanted to go back and finish up with Gideon, but we've run out of time. I'm trying to respect your time. Let me close with this. The road is too rough, I said. Dear Lord, there are stones that hurt me so. And he said, dear child, I understand. You see, I walked that road long ago. But here's a cool green path, I said. Lord, let me walk there for a time. No, child, he gently answered me. The green road does not climb. My burden, I said, is far too great. How can I bear it so? My child, he said, I remembered the weight. I carried the cross, you know. But I said, I wish there were friends with me who would make my way their own. Ah, yes, Jesus said, Gethsemane. That was hard to bear alone. And so I climbed the stony path, content at last to know. That where my master had not gone, I would not need to go. And strangely, I found then new friends. The burden grew less sore. And I remembered long ago, he went that way before. Somebody say praise the Lord. Let's stand together this morning. Father, I pray for every person that is here today. Every man, every woman, every boy, every girl, every mom, every dad, every single adult. Lord, it doesn't matter who it is. If they're sitting under this roof this morning, I pray for them. I plead the blood of Jesus over their soul. There are people here today that are going through tremendous, tremendous difficulty in their life. Some are struggling from psychological battles. Some are struggling from financial pressure that has never been as serious as it is right now. Some have contemplated hurting themselves. Some have tried to hurt themselves. There are some that are worried about their families. There are some that are worried about their marriage. There are some, Lord, that are struggling with physical issues today. They're in pain right now. And they're trying to soldier through. They're trying to make it. And they're hurting right now. Lord, no matter who it is, no matter what the situation might be, no matter what the problem might be, I pray that today you would help us in this very simple little sermon to change our why to what. Instead of sitting around and crying and asking questions and why, 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 help us to remember the old song. We'll understand it better by and by but I'm going to change my why to what and I'm going to say Lord what do you want me to do 
What is the plan going forward? What can I learn from this dark valley of the shadow of death? What can I learn while I'm sitting here eating in the presence of mine enemies? What can I learn? I want to learn that and I want to be better and I want to grow and I want to develop in my walk with God. And Lord, ultimately, I want to obey your command in Mark chapter 8. I want to hear you say, well done, thou good and faithful servant. So Lord, if it means me picking up a cross, if it means me identifying with Calvary, so be it. There's nothing worth going to hell over. There's nothing worth being lost over. There's no person or no thing that would cause me to want to lose my soul. I pray today that somebody would make up their mind to serve you. And as every head is bowed and every eye is closed right now, please respect the sacredness of this moment. We're already going to baptize one young lady in Jesus' name in the other other building here at the conclusion of the service. But if there's anybody else that would like to be baptized today, this morning, right now, in Jesus' name. We have warm water. We have robes. We have towels. We are prepared to baptize you right now. You must be baptized in Jesus' name to be saved. That's the Bible. And I can teach you a whole Bible study on that if you'd like. But if you're here today and you would like to be baptized in Jesus' name, in addition to this young lady that we're going to baptize, I'd like for you to come to this altar, please. As every head is bowed, every eye is closed, please come quickly. Stand here and say, Preacher, I want to get baptized. Let me know. We'll have somebody go with you and get you ready. If you're here today and you would like to repent of your sins, This altar area is open. If you're here today and you would like to receive the gift of the Holy Ghost, this altar area is open. You say, Pastor, I don't even know what to do. Don't worry about that. You come and pray. We will pray with you. We will help you. We will show you. We will talk with you. We will teach you. Jesus is going to help you today. But you're in the right place. And where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. I'm asking the whole church to lift your hands with me right now. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Brother Marcus, if you'll sing something very softly uh, in the background. Everybody in the house, would you pray with me? Father in heaven, on this Sunday morning, there are people whose souls are hanging in the balance. I ask you to touch them right now, God. That there would be that young man. That there would be that young woman. There would be that mom. There would be that dad. There would be that...